So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our gracious God and, and patient Father in heaven, thank you so much for, for your grace, for your mercy. Uh, you've been a God and you are a God who um, has experienced loss and pain and suffering. So you know how we feel. You understand us. And I ask that you will be with us this morning in a special way. I, I need your help. Please uh, give, give me the right words. Uh, give me the right thoughts. That what I will say, there are so many things that could be said that the things I will touch upon, that they will be a blessing and an encouragement to those who are here in this room. And may the words of the psalmist in Psalm 115, verse 1, become reality this morning where he says, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. This is my wish and my prayer. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have come here and expect a seminar where I will give you one, two, three, four, five, ten good reasons how to deal with difficulties and, and challenging situations, this is the wrong place, all right? And there is room for you to leave <laughs> immediately if, if that is your expectations. I'm not going to tell you that. What I have in mind is that I will share a little bit from my own experience, my own life experience, and what has helped me to cope with uh, some things that were not so easy and challenging, and hopefully uh, share a few things that have been helpful for me to maintain um, my spiritual, to remain spiritually sane and even joyful despite some challenging things that uh, can happen in life. So, how shall, I, how, how shall I start? What words can describe what cannot be explained? So how would you explain a, to a person who has never ever fallen in love how it feels to deeply, deeply love another person? How do you explain that? Now, if, you're, if you were to ask me, um, <clears throat> how is it to, to lose your mother? I could tell you that I saw my grandmother die, but not my mother. And that is not quite the same. So every experience of loss every unique experience, all the most beautiful things and the most painful things in life are things where we have difficulties to even find the appropriate words to describe what is going on and what is happening. So in every suffering and every significant loss in life is unique. And when I talk about loss in life, significant loss, I'm not just talking about death to make things very clear. Uh, and it's not just for old people. You know, if you experience um, severe sickness, if you experience a loss of mobility, if you experience a loss of a limp, your arm, your leg, your hand, maybe even one finger, and you are a musician, and you're used to play the piano, and all of a sudden one or two fingers are missing, that is significant loss. If you lose your job, if your marriage breaks, that is significant loss in life. And I think we all experience at one point or another some type of loss. Someone once said, every person you meet loves something, is afraid of something, and uh, the third thing I forgot. 
but every person has lost something. Yes, loves something, is afraid of something, and has lost something. Now, if, if, if you want to start a meaningful conversation with anybody, you start asking those questions. And some people are not willing to talk about the real tough questions. They might be willing to talk about the things they love, and you will learn something important about the person. They might be willing to share a little bit about the things they might be afraid of. And perhaps they are willing even to share the things that they have lost. And you will find that if you talk to other people on that level, it connects. And you really get to know the other person on a level that you will never, ever, just in small talk conversations. So every person experiences loss of some sort in his or her life. And every experience of loss is different. And I cannot provide an answer to all the difficult questions that come along with, with those experiences. But what I will do this morning is I will share a little bit from my own experience, from my own life story, hoping that it might be an encouragement to some of you and uh, that it will help you to confront your own challenges in your own life and find your own personal way on how to deal with them and with the experience of suffering and pain and loss and even death. So here's part of my story. I've been born and raised in Germany, I told you, and I've been blessed by a very, very happy childhood. I have very happy childhood memories. And my mother used to say, let children be children as long as possible. They will get grown up quickly enough. And she was right. And if you have very positive childhood memories, they will last a the whole life. So I grew up in a, in a Christian home, in a Seventh-day Adventist home. My parents are Seventh-day Adventist Christians, and they were committed Seventh-day Adventists. And they grew up, I grew up in, in the faith, so to speak, and uh, I believed in God. I practiced the Adventist faith. I got baptized. Still, every person at one point, earlier or later, has to face some tough questions. And as a teenager, I, I went to an Adventist school and I had some Adventist teachers and some of these teachers were good teachers and some of the teachers, they raised questions in my mind. And they didn't provide the answers to those questions. And those kind of questions kind of threw me off. And I even started questioning the reality of God and, and some other things. Now hardly anybody would have noticed, except perhaps for some very, very good friends who knew me very closely. But uh, these questions were very challenging for me, and, um, and uh, they're, these are kind of questions that defy easy answers. But uh, still, for many, many years, I was never, ever confronted with severe suffering or death, even in my own life. Uh, and it is interesting, perhaps we in the Western countries, in, like in Europe, North America, Australia, we are so um, enlightened and so progressive in our thinking, in our education, in the 21st century, that we think we have advanced so much in the sciences and in medicine that we kind, kind of push away the reality that there is suffering and pain and even death and that we cannot, cannot really control life. That life is beyond our control. And um, that there is sickness and uh, that life is fragile. So how do you deal with that unpopular reality in life if it confronts you? 
You know, I'm, I'm reminded of a passage in the New Testament, in the book of Romans. By the way, this is my PowerPoint. <laughs> Power book. <laughs> so I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I have your full attention, right? In Romans chapter 8, there's an interesting passage that comes to my mind when we talk about the subject. In verse 16, 17, and 18, the Apostle Paul makes a statement. In some other places, you find a similar idea, but let's just focus on that passage. And he says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. So far, so good. And if children, he continues, verse 17, heirs also. Fine, we have no problem with that. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. But now comes a passage that we don't like. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. So we like the glorifying part, but we don't like the part that talks about suffering. And suffering is part of our human reality, is part of our Christian reality. And I think we have to learn as Christians, and I believe as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, to bear adversity and difficulties and challenges of life in such a way that the way we deal with that will be an inspiration to others will instill hope rather than desperation. And that we have to learn even to die in such a way that people will see that is different from what I see with other people who don't have that hope. So that is something we don't often talk about, but I think it's part of our human existence and reality. So in my own life, I was confronted with um, significant loss in the year 2009. And by the way, I will share some personal things, things that are very close to my heart, and, and you will realize that I'm even touched today when I talk about this. So this is not just easy talk for me, but uh, I, I will do it to the glory of God. So I, see, I experienced significant loss in life in the year 2009 when my wife was um, unexpectedly diagnosed with cancer. She had uh, breast cancer, and it was uh, cancer of the most aggressive form. And uh, my wife, Ulrike, she was only um, 43 years old when that breast cancer was diagnosed with her. And um, I can tell you, she didn't choose to have cancer. Neither did we, as a family, chose that she should become sick. It's something that happened. And um, she was still young, I think, with 43. She had a future ahead of her. She was still needed. We had three children, three sons at that time. The youngest, just 11 years old. The oldest 19, and we felt this is not really what we have envisioned for our lives. This is not what we had planned. This is not something that we desired. And um, after several years, fulfilling years as a mother and, uh, and uh, housewife, my wife had just started and begun to teach in her profession again. She was an elementary teacher. She loved to teach. And she was appreciated by the children and by the parents and her peers. And she had just started to teach part-time. By the way, just a little footnote. We don't, we don't often hear about this. This morning we heard a little bit in a, in a plenary presentation about this. But I think we too rarely, too rarely appreciate the great contribution that women make 
when they decide to stay at home and be available for the children and the family. My children would not be what they are today if my wife had not made a conscientious decision to stay at home and see that as her priority in life. She loved to teach. And when the children were older enough, she started to teach part-time because she still felt home is first priority and, and, and children were, were more independent with, with age and, and that gave her a little, a little bit more freedom. I think this is a word from a man to the male audience here. You men, I think we don't appreciate enough and we don't express our appreciation to the women who make that contribution to the home, to the church, to the society at large. And uh, often you don't know what intense work is involved at home. Just, I mean, I've learned it the hard way. <laughs> Just to cook <laughs> and do all the rest of the thing is quite a logistical challenge, you know? Anyhow, so I think we, we need to appreciate that more and to express the value and the great contribution that is often missing in society at large for that type of work. It's really, it's work. It's hard work. Anyhow, so she had just started to work part-time again when she found out that she had cancer. And if you would have known my wife, you would have known her and remembered her as a person who was, um, she, she, she had the most healthy lifestyle you could imagine. I mean, she never smoked, she never drank alcohol, of, of course. But she, she exercised, she was happy, she had a, a friendly disposition. She, she, um, she, she was cooking healthy vegetarian meals and she still got sick. And it didn't take even one year after she found out that she had cancer that she died. That's a short time. And um, we tried everything. And you know how it goes. You know, the moment people find out that uh, there is someone sick and cancer, you are swamped with um, recommendations and, uh, and people know all kinds of special treatments that almost uh, work miraculously and have the most powerful effects and we tried everything. We tried everything and my, my wife was consistent in her lifestyle. She was positive. She was, she was a, a spiritual person. We, we even had Dr. Nedley in our house. We talked with him. We consulted with the best of the best, with uh, the people who had the latest research in medicine and science. And much of that, what we heard, helped us in, in, in dealing with that, and yet, it didn't get better. It got worse, and it got worse. We prayed about it. We prayed about it often. In fact, my wife um, requested a special anointment, anointment for the sick. She requested it twice at the beginning of her sickness and towards the end of her ordeal. I'm a pastor. I have worked as a pastor. I have, I have, I've been called to have anointments for the sick in the church and I have seen miracles. I have seen people with cancer and the cancer was gone. So I know God can do it. I firmly believe it to this day. But he didn't do it with her. Now, how do you explain that? You can't. See, there are some things in life where we do not have an answer for. And we do not have an easy explanation. And um, it is interesting. 
those who knew my wife would certainly testify, I believe, that she was an amazing, amazing example of faithfulness, consistency. She had unwavering trust in God. And when she died, she was at peace with herself. She was at peace with her family. She was at peace with God. She died, and for her, death was a relief from the pain and the suffering. For us, it was a harsh loss. See, somebody has said, one's own death, everybody just dies for himself. But the death of others, you have to learn to live. And that is the challenge for all those who survive the death of a person who is loved. You have to learn to live with the absence of someone you loved. You have to learn to live with something missing in your life. You have to learn to live with death and the consequences of death. And I think that is the challenge for every one of us. And death is, uh, is very painful. It's not a happy experience. And if um, every person experiences death uh, differently, every single child of us has, uh, has dealt differently with the loss of his mother. And uh, no experience is just the same. And, um, <clears throat> and even though it was a relief for her, for us, her death is uh, acutely felt. The absence of her is, is still painful. So um, uh, why is it painful? It's painful because, um, because she is missing. Her good counsel is missing. We can't talk to her anymore. We can't listen to her insights. We can't uh, benefit from the humor she has, from her smile, from her laughs. Uh, we can't uh, consult with her. We can't receive her input. We can't feel her touch. We can't feel the closeness. And uh, that pain is acutely felt. And she, her death really has robbed us of a number of um, experiences that, um, that she will never be able to see and participate. My wife will never be able to, to know the feeling, how it felt that my oldest son, our oldest son, Jonathan, got married over a year ago. She will never ever have the joy of perhaps holding her own grandchild in her arms, if there will be grandchildren later on. She has seen her youngest son when he was 11. Now he's 20. He looks different. He has changed over time. And that is the challenge that goes along with losing a person that you love. Now, sometimes people try to, um, to say things. I, I think they mean it well. They, they, they want to comfort you, they want to say something that instills hope, but not everything that other people say, even though they mean it well, is that helpful, at least not in my experience. So sometimes people would say, well, they wouldn't say it that drastically, but the essence is, well, it's, you don't have to be uh, sad, you know, you will see her again, right? We have this hope, don't we? Yes, we do. Do I believe that I will see her again? Sure, I firmly believe that. But it was no consolation for me. It was no, no comfort for me. Because I was missing her, I'm missing her in the now. 
not in the future. And her presence is, is dearly missed by many now and in the here and now rather than uh, in the future life. So uh, not everything that we believe is true is that comforting in the moment you experience significant loss in life. And um, <clears throat> it, is, it is interesting that if you experience something like that, I think um, it is so um, traumatic that you need to have a network of support that will carry you through when you go through the valley of shadows. You know, it's, if, if you experience that, you're not quite clear in your thinking. I mean, you just, you just function. And you need help in the most basic things. Let me, let me illustrate that a little bit to be more specific and to give you an idea of what has been helpful in my own personal life and experience. I'm a pastor. I work for the church. And when you work as a pastor in leadership positions, you get to know sometimes, you get to know things in the church that are not so nice, right? You get to know details and you have information about things that are not so enjoyable. But I have to say that in that experience, I'm really truly grateful for the experience of having a church. I have seen other people who have had cancer with my wife, who didn't belong to a church, who didn't have that community of faith, who didn't have that support system, and they truly felt lonely. They didn't have anybody to care for, uh, for them. They didn't have anybody who, who, would, um, who would support them. And in those, in those situations, I think what is most crucial and most helpful is that you, um, that you are sensitive to little gestures of friendliness, I call them. To little gestures of helpfulness that brighten your day. Uh, that can be very small things, almost insignificantly small things, but that can make a big, huge difference. Um, sometimes people, um, they would talk to you and they would say, um, uh, yeah, and listen, uh, if you should ever need any help, just give me a ring, let me know. I've had plenty of people uh, talk to me like that, and they mean it, they really mean it. But I never called them. Because, you know, it, it, it's an effort to go to the telephone, to the cell phone, and dial the number, and then start talking if you don't feel like talking, if you don't know what the other person will say and how the, the person will react and so forth. So if you really want to do a person who has suffered a significant loss in life a favor, be creative, do some thinking. It might be hard work, but there is, <laughs> there is no replacement for hard thinking. And, and put yourself into the shoes of that person and think what, what would be a help in that situation. And then just do it. And, uh, you know, surprise them with a meal so that they don't have to cook. Um, I like flowers. Send them some flowers to brighten the day and to, to get some sunshine <laughs> in the room, you know. Uh, just a smile, just a smile of encouragement, uh, just uh, a little message of hope. You know, um, you can text message on your cell phone, that's nice, but there is something that is unsurpassed, and that is to write a little postcard the old-fashioned way, you know, with pencil and pen, handwriting, and just a word of encouragement, just a word of, of of positive thing, something that makes the person smile and, and think about something else. Um, 
here's something that was most helpful for me. I've learned that uh, I, I had read this some, someplace that uh, if you have children and one of the spouse, uh, one of the parents dies, one of the most difficult things for children, especially when they are smaller, is that in a situation like that, they are often put to many different people who take care of them. Grandma here, grandpa there, other grandma here, uncle here, aunt there, good friend there. And for them, this means stress. It means who is responsible for me? How is my daily routine guaranteed? I don't know where I will be tomorrow. I don't know who will take care of me tomorrow and the day after tomorrow and, and so forth. So for small children, the most important thing in a situation like that is to have a consistency, to have the daily routine, the basic things go on undisturbed, as undisturbed as possible. So for me, that was something that, that, that I thought that will help us as a family, uh, me as a single parent with my children, to, to continue that daily routine is to have common meals. Uh, breakfast in the morning, lunch, and then in the evening. Now, <clears throat> I'm not a good cook, I have to confess, you know. I do cook, I've never burned water, you know. <laughs> I like to eat well, you know, and good things, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not particularly good at cooking. I lived at a campus uh, at Bogenhofen and they invited me to, to join them in the cafeteria. I could have done that. But I knew full well that if I were to go there, there were other students and faculty and people who saw me and they wanted to talk to me and I would not have that close personal interaction with my children. And usually, you know, children, if you ask them, how was school, how, how's life, don't, they don't tell you right away. It takes time. And it's usually over a meal that things start opening up and the real issues come to the surface. So I thought, you know, I'd like to maintain that routine. My wife, she was a wonderful cook and she cooked and she provided that stability. So I wanted to continue that. Now to cook is a challenge. I mean, you have to learn that. You have to learn how to prepare the things that they are ready at the same time so that one thing is not getting cold where the other is not ready yet, you know, and you have to put it in the table and you have to, you have to work full time and then you have to, to cook and you have to prepare and then you have to do the dishes and everything. It's stress, <laughs> you know, daily stress that they manage and do and we don't appreciate as men. Do it for, for just a couple days and you appreciate the work of your wife and your spouse is much more. So here's what really helped me. In the church there was a lady, a good friend of mine, the wife of, of the best friend of mine, and she said, is there anything that, that we can do for you? I said, yes, I would like to continue that daily routine. She says, I have an idea. You don't have to think about anything. Here's what I will do. I will set up a plan in the church I will call the people. What are your most busy days in the week? When you have to teach in the morning, in the afternoon, when you don't have any time, I said, I have three days that are the most busy days in the week. She says, no problem. I will take care of that. I will find people who will provide a meal, a hot meal for you and the children for three days in the week. You don't have to call anybody. You don't have to do anything. They will bring the food to you. They will place the food in front of your door. You don't even have to open the door. You don't even have to talk to them. You know, sometimes people, they come to you and they, they do something well, you know, and you open the door and you just don't feel to, as, as if you want to see anybody. You just want to, to be for yourself, you know. And they're nice, you know, and they, ask, they start asking questions, and that's tough, and it's, it's, it's difficult. So she said, they will place the food in front of your door, they will leave, you eat, you enjoy, you do the dishes, 
you place the food in front of your door the next day, they pick it up. You don't even have to drive to their home. Now that was a real help. And they continued to do that for three months. Can you believe it? Three meals a week for three months. The first three months, the most difficult three months. You find that only in the church. <laughs> and all of a sudden you appreciate that there is something like community and fellowship and that there are people who really think what could be a blessing to you in a situation like that. I had one family, they continued to do that for one meal a week at my most busiest day for one and a half years. Just for free, just out of courtesy. Now that is real help. You know, there is help, and then there is real help. <laughs> there is help, and then there is helpful help. And it's not the same. You know? So think about things that would be helpful help for a person in that situation. Someone said, you know, you have to clean the house, you have to vacuum, you have to iron, you have to clean the bathroom. I have somebody. She will come once a week and she will do all that for you. She paid for that person. And they came. And it was a real help because in the first couple weeks and month, you don't even have, you know, you, you, you don't even think about all these things. And then the home looks like a mess and everything. So people really took down and thought about things that would be a real helpful help things like that. So if you find that, um, do that. And, and, uh, uh, and people will appreciate that. There, there are so many other things and facets that, uh, that I could talk about. Let me just mention um, two, two other things that, that come to my, uh, to my mind. You know, sometimes if you uh, if you lose your partner, you find yourself alone. And sometimes it's just a, a blessing if you have another good friend, another person, where it is appropriate. And that person gives you a little hug, a little pat on the shoulder, a little handshake, a little physical contact. Now, last night, I was on the platform for a short short presentation, 30 second presentation, and I came back and uh, I didn't know anybody in the audience so I sat in a, in a row f alone. All of a sudden another person came and sat right next to me. It was so nice. I didn't sit alone. Because why is that important? See, um, when, you, when you are a widower or widow when you lost your partner, something changes. Something changes even in your social status in society. See, if you are single, a young person, not married, and you have uh, somebody that you marry, your status, your social status in society changes. All of a sudden, you change from being single to being category married. And now you belong to those people who are married. You're in a different category, social category. And everybody who is married knows there is something to that. You have still the same friends, but it's, it's still not quite as if you were unmarried before. You know, you're, people recognize you're in a different social category. And if you lose a partner, all of a sudden, you switch the categories again. And you are no longer category married. You no longer belong to that group. You're all of a sudden category widow, widower. And it's this different social category. And people treat you differently, unwittingly. And you're alone rather than belonging to a group. And to, to realize that, 
can help to relate to other people of, uh, of that experience. And so sit with them in church, invite them home, to your home, you know. Uh, they wouldn't feel free to, to come to your home as they uh, are used to because they are all couples. And all of a sudden, you know, they're the couples and they are alone. You know, they, they don't fit into that setting anymore. And so it takes a deliberate invitation, a deliberate effort to say, come on, we want to have you along. You're a part of that. And, uh, and that is helpful. Here's another thing that I, I realized that uh, was most helpful for me to cope with the reality of loss. Sometimes people, they don't know, um, they don't know what to say in a situation like that, and they, um, in order to avoid that, um, to say something wrong, they'd rather say nothing. And sometimes they, especially in religious circles, they would, uh, they would say things, you know, oh, we have this hope, and there will be a resurrection, and you'll see her again, and, and so forth. But that was not comforting to me. What was most comforting to me was when people actually took the time and sat down and thought about an incident, an encounter, something that they experienced with my wife, something that they appreciated with her, something where they remembered her in a certain situation, and they described that situation and they described that kindness or that courtesy or that incidence that, that made a lasting positive impression on their mind. And they shared that with me. For me, this was healing bomb. This was healing to the wounds. It was not painful. It, it, it was a blessing. It helped me to, to deal with the reality of loss in a, in a much different way than just saying, my condolences and uh, we'll have this hope and so forth. Because you don't need to, meet, to think very much, you know, to say a few words like that. But to really think about how do I remember that person? What do I appreciate about that person? What was special about that person? What was unique about that person? And then put that into words. It expresses something of your appreciation and the relationship you had to that person. And it's, it's a healing experience, at least for me and I think for many others who have uh, similar experiences like that. So here is another thing that I want to share with you. When you experience loss like that and pain that goes along with it, this loss has... Um, is an acute temptation to our faith. It even has the potential to make you go shipwreck in your faith, to lose faith over that. And why is that? Because um, pain raises some of the most difficult questions about God and his character, questions that are not easy to answer, not for anybody, I think. And the doubt that suffering initiates in your thinking uh, has even the potential to destroy your faith. And all of a sudden, you realize that more general responses and standard answers no longer carry. They don't, don't have the power to convince. And this is when, for most people, these difficult why questions come up. Have you ever heard those why questions? Why did that happen? Why did that happen to me? Why her? Why not somebody else? And you can extend out a litany of why questions. And they are not easy to answer. And um, it is often that those why questions come up because we have a fundamental question about the goodness of God. So here's my question to you. We often say, God is good. Amen? Well, I hear amens here. That's good. So do you really believe that? 
Do you, do you believe that God is good? Amen. Do you really believe that? Do you believe that God is only good, nothing but good, from head to toe, from A to Z, from beginning to end, through and through, 100%, nothing but good? Amen? Or do you believe what most people believe? See, most people believe, when you ask them the questions, they would say, oh yeah, God is good, no question about it. In fact, they would say, he is very good. He is very good very often, but not always. See, that's what most people think. They believe God is good, he's very good, He's very good very often, but not always. And if you're not sure that God is good always, how can you trust him when life gets tough? In exactly those moments where you don't have the answers, how can you trust him then? And that's the moment when all those why questions come up. Because then, because you don't know you're not convinced that God is truly good all the time, then you first need an answer from God why this happened, right? And only if you have that answer will you be able to accept it or not. And that is a challenge with many people. And I think we have to learn to trust God in such a way that we will trust him even though we don't have all the answers to all those questions. If you were to ask me why my wife had to die, I don't have an answer to that. Now, many people cannot bear this uncertainty. They cannot bear not to have an answer for something that is pressing and existentially important to their lives. So in order to find an answer, people then resort to making all kinds of strange associations and constructions in order to legitimize, to rationalize, to explain why something had to happen. Because then I have an answer and a reason why things happened. Otherwise, I don't have a reason. And if you don't have a reason, it's difficult to bear. So people would then come to me and would say, well, you know, maybe your wife had to die. And now comes the answer. So that you are more sympathetic to other people of similar loss. It's a good answer, right? Yeah, that's what many people think. It was not helpful for me. <laughs> didn't help me, really. And I don't think that is the answer to that experience. Why? Well, I hope I learned something in that whole experience, and I hope I, I grew more compassionate. I hope. But I don't think that she had to die in order for me to learn that lesson. God could have used many, many other avenues to teach me that lesson without having her to die. So we don't have all the answers to all those questions. And sometimes it's better if we just stay silent and bite on your tongue, you know, <laughs> rather than come up with some strange explanation that might help you to find a reason why things happen, had to happen. When in fact we really don't know. And we have to trust God and his goodness. Because we have all the reasons in this world to believe that God is good. Amen? Amen. By the way, how do you know that God is good? You all said yes, amen, amen. Prove me with one Bible text from scripture that God is good. No. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say that God is good. John 16, 360, no. Well, that's a conclusion, but it doesn't say that. So where is the Bible? Where's the Bible proof here? Come on, people. People of the book, where is the Bible text that says that God is good? 
all things work together for good. Doesn't say that God is good. Sorry. Close but not quite. Very good. Where is that? It's Luke 18, right. Good master, he says, why do you call me good? There is only one who is good and that is God. By the way, it, it's good to know your Bibles, right? <laughs> Some of the most common things that we believe, like God is good, don't appear that often in the Bible, and they are nevertheless true. There are just a few texts that say God is good. That is one of them, Luke 18. But it's a biblical truth that God is good, right? And we know it from many other things, but it's good to know your Bibles. So if, if some people ask you, you know, how do you know that God is good? Well, that is one passage that will specifically tell that the Bible says that God is good. So we know that God is good. We have every reason to believe. And I don't have the answer to all the questions. But I know the one who has. And rather than having all the answers, it is better to trust the one who has the answers, even though I don't see the answers. And, and that is, I think, what we have to learn. Because if we want to go through the end times, we have to trust that God is good, that he will carry us through, that he will delight us to see, to see us in heaven, that he will do everything to save us. And by the way, when God tries everything to save us, it's pretty much because he's almighty, right? <laughs> he can do quite, quite a number of things that are impossible to us. So he will do everything. If there is a, a glimpse of hope, he will make sure that, that this will go through. So, <clears throat> these why questions. We had our own set of why questions. These are the questions that we raised and we asked. I talked to my wife. We, we, I had the privilege to talk openly with her, even, even about her death. And by the way, I think that is most helpful <coughs> if you are honest in your conversations and if you address things as they really are even though it's painful for you to even say it we have to face reality and we have to to confront reality and we have to deal with reality so here are the, the why questions that we raised we said why why should that happen only to others and not to us. Well, you tell me why. Why should only other people get cancer and not we? Why should sickness, why should suffering, why should death only affect others and not us? After all, we live in a sinful world. There's sickness all around us. There's pollution around us. We are part of that system. And we can't escape until Jesus comes back and creates a new world that is free of all of that. So why shouldn't that affect us as well? Yes, we have a health message. Yes. Yes, it prevents sickness and, and many diseases. But it's not a guarantee that none of us will ever get sick. And that's not even biblical. You know, even the Apostle Paul, he had this thorn in the flesh he prayed three times, and God did not remove it. The prophet Elijah, he died after a long sickness, probably cancer. He died. Why didn't God heal him? You, know? you have people like that in the Bible. So the Bible doesn't promise us that we will never get sick, that we will never, never die. I mean, we'll, we'll have eternal life later. But so, as long as we're in this world, I think we have to cope with that reality. And so uh, that, is, that is something. How much time do we have? Till 12 o'clock? <clears throat> so um, let me share maybe in conclusion uh, another thing that was um, helpful for me in dealing with that whole experience. Um, when you're in difficult times and circumstances, you often 
hope that these difficult circumstances will change. And you often pray that difficult people and difficult circumstances change to the better. And um, when we do, though, we tend to focus on the difficulties in life. Have you ever noticed that? And you pray just about the negative things and the difficulties in your life. And we, um, we then desperately wait that everything somehow changes to the better and we focus just on our obstacles and on our difficulties. And then we start to compare ourselves with others. And we start to envy those who are better off than we are. And then we ask, why is that, Lord, that they are not sick, but I am? Why are they more wealthy than I am? And why is this or that? And in doing so, we actually focus more on ourselves than looking to God, who is alone the foundation and the surety of our hope. And my experience in situations like that is that <clears throat> I have to make a decision. That God calls me to make a decision. Do I allow my impatience, do I allow my doubts to question God's goodness and power to help? Or can I start seeing in the challenges of life unique opportunities that help me to become the very person that God wants me to be and that I would never be without that challenge. See, that is the real decision that we have to face. Have you ever thought that the difficulties that you face might be there that you have an opportunity to grow into the person that God desires you to be that you would never be if you would not face that difficulty and that challenge. I still distinctly remember the moment when I realized what that meant for me. Was I really, really willing to accept the loss of my wife as part of my life? See, that is the question. Am I willing to accept that reality? That was something I had never wished for myself. That is something that I have never planned. That is something that I've never desired. This is not how I had envisioned the second part of my life. And it was not my fault. And it was not her fault. And yet, it was part of my life. It was something that had become part of my biography, of my story. And it is something that distinguishes me from anybody else in this world. It has made my life truly unique. It has become part of my identity. And more important than what is happening to me, after all, is how I respond to what is happening to me. It's not the most important thing what happens to you. The, the really important thing is how you respond to what is happening to you. And to accept that reality was tough. I was not willing to accept that reality for a long time. Uh, because this is not how I had planned my life. This is not how I had desired my life to be. And it, it occurred to me then, at one moment, that, uh, um, that it is rather tempting to remain in this illusionary state of mind, in this make-believe world, in which I would not allow that reality of her loss to be really part of my life. It seemed far easier to repress that painful experience. And many people do. And they will never get over that experience and they will never ever learn to live their life in a new dimension 
in a new rea reality without that, that partner that no longer is there. Uh, only when I had the courage to really confront this mechanism of denial and when I was honest to face that painful reality of the absence of my wife in my life with all the implications that, that came along with it, was I able to cautiously reorder my daily life in a new way without her. And it has helped me to, to see things in a different light and to, to be open to new possibilities and options now. Um, <clears throat> I still remember when I, I was, bad, that's a, this is a battle that is going on in your soul, you know. Am I willing to accept that as a reality of my life? And I still remember reading a letter of a good friend of my wife. She had gone through uh, difficult situations in her life. Her sister had committed suicide. Her mother got sick, very sick. Another uh, sister, the marriage was breaking apart. And, and she, she was wondering, why is this happening to me? Why, why, why to me? Why not to other people? Why to me? Until it occurred to her that this is part of her life. This is part of what makes her life her. And when I realized that, the battle was, am I willing to accept that? And I still remember that, um, that moment when I was willing to accept that. I had to cry. That was tough. I had to cry, but at the same time, it was a relief. It was as if uh, tons of weighty stones you know, would fall off my shoulders. And I would all of a sudden become free to reorder my own life with a new reality. And to see that perhaps God wants to use that, not that he sends that, but that he wants to use that to shape me into that person that he wants me to be, that I would perhaps never be without that experience. And I think that's the beauty of God's plan. He doesn't like suffering. He doesn't send sickness. He doesn't delight in pain. But he is sovereign enough to use it still to his glory. If we allow him to be shaped in that experience by his grace so that we can grow into people that trust him even though we don't have all the answers. Um, I could go on and on and on. There is much more that could be said uh, about an experience like that. Um, let me just, uh, I have to say this now. Let me just point you to this book. I don't know whether you've seen that book, Longing for God. It's a prayer and Bible journal. I wrote that book. It has grown basically out of my experience that I just shared with you. And if you're in a, in, a, in a situation like that, it's tough. I mean, you, you can go crazy over things. And so um, what I have written in that book has grown out of that experience, and it's, it's tested and tried. So it's not just theory. I, I have I've experienced, I've, I've tried every single line in that book. Now, if you open the book, most of the book is empty pages. That's why I could write it so easily, you know. <laughs> but it's, it's basically, it's a, it's a Bible prayer journal. It's a journal where you have an opportunity for every day of the year to read a passage from the Old Testament and a passage from the New Testament and to write down the thoughts that come to your mind as you read the Bible. It's a little introduction at the beginning, a very simple introduction on how to read the Bible for all it's worth. And it's a wonderful gift even for your non-Adventist neighbors who've never read the Bible, who don't know how to open that book and to go about, to give them an introduction to read the Bible for themselves without any commentary, just to read the Word of God for the pleasure of it. And then for every for every day, you have room to write down prayer requests and prayer ideas. 
And if you were to follow that reading plan from the Old and New Testament, it will lead you within one year, it will lead you through the entire Bible. You will have read through the entire Bible from A to Z. At the end of every month, I have a, a short chapter, just a short few pages on prayer. So 12 times throughout the year, you have an inspiration on prayer that you can try out something new about praying. You know, we usually pray, if we are honest, most of our prayers, they tend to be, Lord, I need your help. Can you help me here? Can you help my children there? Help me do this, do this, do this. This is not the kind of prayer that Jesus and God delights in. So I have a short prayer, a chapter on, on the prayer that God delights in and how can we pray in such a way that it's not centered on us, but it's centered on God. And, uh, and then I, one of my favorite uh, chapters is uh, at the end of May, I have prayers for others. And I came across that idea when I read an, another uh, book and I have 31 reasons 31 reasons, basically, for every day of the month, 31 reasons to pray for other people with the words of Scripture. And I started doing that for my own children. And what I've did, you know, you have in the Bible, you have texts that talk about virtues, patience, love, steadfastness, uh, um, uh, courage, and so forth. And so I have taken Bible passages, and with the words of the Bible, you can fill in the name of another person, your child, and pray specifically for your child that on that day, Lord, let him be a person who has self-control. On that day, Lord, let him be a person to be generous. Let him be a person who is kind in his dealing with other people. So you, you ask for specific things that you would like to see in the life of that other person. And I realized when I pray, and I started praying for my children that way, it's more direct than just praying, help them in their exams, help them here and there. It's so general that you hardly find out, you know, whether God has answered that prayer. And when I started doing that, I realized, well, if my prayers are really uh, meaningful in any way, I had to start being that person that I want to see in the other person. And then I realized, oh, this is actually is not just something for my children. I can use the same thing for the children in the children's Sabbath school that I teach in my church, or for my uh, colleagues at work, or for my students that I teach. And, and you can fill in any name, you know, and you pray specifically one month, different things for other people that you would like to see in their lives. So you have, um, you have many wonderful things that you can try out, but I also tackle some tough ones. Like what you do when your prayers are not answered. Maybe you've never experienced that, you know. You just experience the answers to all your prayers, but sometimes we are faced with the reality that some of our prayers are not answered. And what is happening then? What are we going through then? And I have one chapter on how to deal with things that are not answered, and what about praying and fasting, and, uh, and so forth. So it's 12 suggestions, you know, that you can try out and, and find out uh, a, a new dimension in your spiritual life that will help you to open up new horizons in your experience with God. <sighs> Time is almost up, but we have two more minutes. So I'll take two more minutes to explain one thing that has tremendously helped me cope over the grief and get a new perspective, an attitude of gratitude. How do you get thankful when you don't feel like being thankful? You know, if, if you experience loss, you don't feel thankful. So there's one chapter in here where I explain that, and just briefly, let me uh, allow to, to share that with you. It's powerful, powerful, powerful. It's life-changing. It has just one, one drawback. The drawback is, it's absolutely free. 
doesn't cost you a penny. And because it's free and it doesn't cost you a penny, many people don't give, even give it a try. If you can go over that drawback, if you can live with that drawback, it will be a powerful tool for you to change your life. So here, how can you develop an attitude of gratitude? Take a sheet of paper, piece of paper, blank piece of paper, write down 10 words, just 10 words for which you are thankful for. That is hard work, especially if you face loss and you are angry. You don't think about even five things that you are grateful for. You have to think, hard thinking, to find things. You say, I, 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 nothing comes to my mind. Well, think, you know. Start maybe with your eyes. Say, I, because I'm thankful that I can see colors that I can read, you know, that I can orient myself. I'm, I'm thankful that I have a hand and fingers. And with that fingers I can hold a book and open a book and write and type and touch a person. I wouldn't be able to do that if I wouldn't have a hand. You can say I'm, I'm grateful that I have a bed a mattress to sleep in, rather than lying on the cold floor. So you write down 10 things. Once, you write, once you've written down 10 things, you form a short sentence with that one word. And in that sentence, you express the reason why you are thankful for. So I'm thankful for my hand because with my hand I can do this and that. I'm thankful that I have a, a bed to, to rest rather than having to lie on the cold floor. Ten, ten sentences. Once you've written down the sentence, you read the sentence aloud. So you write, you read, you hear, you speak, and the more of your senses are involved, the deeper the thought will be ingrained in your thinking. So 10 things. The next day, you take a new sheet of paper, 10 new reasons. And if you want to intensify the experience, repeat the 10 first reasons from the previous day. At the end of just one week, just one week, you have 70 reasons to be grateful for. And I guarantee you, you cannot consciously exercise that. And be a grouchy person, <laughs> grumpy person. It doesn't, doesn't work. It'll change something in you. And the moment you look at things differently, you look from a different perspective, you develop a new attitude. And it's life-changing. More of that is in the book. You can get it at Pacific Press. I, I, you know, they told me yesterday they have a generous supply of three copies. Three. So first come, first serve. <laughs> the good news, the ABC booth has another couple copies. So if you go there, you find more copies. If they are sold out, don't worry. You can go to Amazon.com. You can get it there or through the ABC at your home. And uh, you might want to have a look at that. Sorry for the little advertisement, but I had to do that at the end of my thing. It was a joy for me to be with you here, and I hope some of the things that I shared have been helpful for you, and uh, you can pass it on, and may we all, may we all be people who delight in God, who long to see God, and who are faithful to Him in the long run. Praise God.